Welcome to Film 101. Today's guest is Christopher Slater. He is a filmmaker, writer, we studied at uni together, and he kind of accidentally almost became an actor. Very accidentally. Tell us about actually, Chris, first of all, the starting point. Like, what was it just uni films that you started playing everyone's dad? In? Absolutely. If I'm <laughs> yes, probably, you're probably part of it, actually. Mm. So, because True. being at uni studying film, I was basically the, the closest old guy. So if there was a role for an old guy, I just said, hey, slow up, quick, jump in here. <laughs> yeah. So I did. Anyway, you know, just, I must have some sort of a little bit of a, a knack for it, I guess, and it just sort Definitely. of took And then, uh, yes, yeah, so that's kind of what it was, just doing uni films. I actually uni told films. Ryan, who was in here, another director that wasn't from our uni from Sunny Coast, I said, Chris saved me from being the oldest guy in the uni <laughs> class, I think. <laughs> 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 They lied to me so badly, they lied to me. Are there like heaps of material? Yeah. I mean, that was a few, but you know, there's, what, where do you start counting mature age? There was, well, exactly right. That was the whole thing. I think mature age. 19. Was, <laughs> I think it was 21. I think it was yeah, 21 okay. on. Because there was a few to it, like, people who had done a degree came back. But yeah, yeah, it was mainly babies. I remember first age thinking, yeah. oh, this is like crazy. Like, look how nervous all these, these people <laughs> seem like little kids to me. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about that. Like, acting. So you, is it like, do you remember the exact first thing you tried and you're like, oh, this is fun? Uh, I do. I think it was in, um, I was, I'd finished, only a couple of weeks in and we were doing whatever the first, we were doing one of these big group assignments and I was walking past and I was mates, by that stage of the game, uh, Caitlin and I, Caitlin O'Brien, mm -hmm. had kind of paled up in one of the um, television subjects and um, multicam, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And so she was mates with Richard Mildred. And I was walking past, I think I'd been there late and was going home, and they were shooting up in the thing, and they said, oh, quick, we need someone to play a Mr. Big, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> like a, a crime caper thing. Yeah. So, um, so all I did was I just sat there, and then I think the voice thing, I, I did something with the voice, with a, a big, deep voice about, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's kind of where it took off from. And then I think I played a priest about a week later in we were marrying someone, and I got to do that, and then it just kind of... Everything got it well. A lot of yeah. newsreader jobs. <laughs> Did a lot of voiceover. A lot of yeah, voiceover. yeah. Got a great voice for it, obviously. Yeah, um, that. yeah it was the first thing you did with me when we did that three sixty film. Was I think that's cool. I might put a clip yeah. back in because it's like that a so VR cool. film where you can watch it in every angle. It was so cool. It was fun to do. You look at the people that were in that. Yeah, like this yeah. is yeah. talented. Yeah. <laughs> that was you know, Hans was in it. Donnie Baxter. Mm -hmm. um, who else was Caitlin there? Hill. Caitlin Hill, yes. Mm -hmm. Great local uh, actors and done yeah. a lot of plays and everything and being in big films. And who was the... Who ran the thing? It was... Um, Korshik Das. Oh, Korshik Das, yeah. yeah. There you go, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so we had like... The Furnace. Oh, yeah, that's great. He yeah, got, he that was, was a really good role. He was so good in that. He was so good in that. Let's talk about Cracker Milk. How did you get... Did you get the call up for... Uh, it's an interesting story, actually. So Connor, Connor started it like he, Connor was a year ahead of us at uni. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't really know him when we were at uni at all. Actually, I was aware of Elias because he was a shooter, and so you, know, you always know who the good shooters are. Yeah, great. Um, but Connor, I didn't really know at all, and um, so he'd already been doing cracker milk since before he got to uni. So he'd been mm. doing it from school, just his own little you know skits sitting around the house and. That's great. Strategy. That's how you get in. Yeah, so you get in early. Yeah. That's why it's so yeah. easy to grow. So he, he started it, and then um, when he got to uni, he was doing it with Elias, and uh, there were a few other people there. Um, uh, Shay, she was involved then too, and um, and uh, I can't think who else was in there at the time. Um, oh, mine's gone blank. So <laughs> I did not. But anyway, so yeah. I um, so anyway, I, but then I did. Um, the writer's retreat, which you've been on as well, out to Winton. Yep, okay. So it was my first year out of uni, and so he was two years out of uni, and they, like you did, I think the next year, you get the invite to go out there and be, mm -hmm. pitch something, write something, get out there and you know, do the thing. So, and at that time, um, they put us up at the North Gregory. Uh, so we actually yeah. had a hotel room as opposed to what we had to cop, you know, later on. So <laughs> <laughs> it was getting worse and worse as it was. But, um, so, and Connor and I got room together. Oh, of course. Cool. Yeah, it was, um, it was, we just got room together. It was weird. Anyway, so, and for some reason we just clicked, just clicked. And it was, we just had the same sort of sense of humour. Um, 
he enjoyed a beer, as did I. So <laughs> we were just we found ourselves doing that all the time. So we just we just got on like a house on fire. And how it came about was we were literally had had, had a had, had a big lunch in the you know, pub lunch with a couple of beers and we we're having a bit of an afternoon snooze in our rooms. <laughs> yeah. And our room had like his single bed there and my single bed over here sort of away from each other. And I'm sort of lying there going, and he already had a following on Instagram. So he said, look, I've just got to do a quick you know, little Instagram story for the fans, you know, to, yeah. just so you might help me out. I'm like, yeah, sure, no worries. So he goes, uh, hey, everyone. Um, just did a live. He said, hey, everyone, I'm, uh, I'm out here at Winton, as you know. Uh, he said, I told you I was out here on a, on, a, on a writer's retreat, but I'm also out here trying to reconnect with my father who I haven't seen for years. <laughs> um, hey, say hello, Dad. And he turned to me and I just went, fuck off. <laughs> said, well, uh, yeah, it's not going that well, right? So <laughs> that was the gag. It was just as simple as that. Yeah, just like anyway. not getting on with your dad. Yeah. yeah Relatable exactly. and simple. Good, right? So I was just knocking it down. Yeah. So anyway, it became a running gag that week that Connor would come and he'd just come up to me at inappropriate times and start pretending to be my son and, yeah. I, and I'd pretend to be his dad and shut him down. And, <laughs> the and the only time it got awkward, there was only one time it got awkward, <laughs> and that was... Um, the great Marlene Cummins was out there as a uh, as a special guest. So Marlene Cummins is is a, a national treasure, and um, she was out there because Rachel Perkins had done a film of her mm-hmm. called um, uh, Black Panther Woman. So oh, okay. what happened was so. So she, a narrative or a docker? A docker. Oh, cool. So Marlene was um, a she was a local from up there. She was a, a little girl, and she. But she was um, an artist and a singer. And she went, she moved to Sydney to further her art, mm-hmm. but was paying the bills with her singing. She was a beautiful soul voice, right? Anyway, on the back of that, she got um, a commission or she got a, a scholarship to New York as a, as a young girl, right? So she's gone over there and, um, and she's a First Nations kid, right? Mm-hmm. So she goes over there in the 70s as this bright-eyed, bushy-tailed girl who's over there to do her art, but, you know, again, getting all these gigs, singing, that sort of stuff. So she's making a name for herself in the art world and just fell in with the Black Panther movement, right? Because they were, you know, young black guys who were all good-looking, as she said, and she was just, you know... Yeah, they're like kind of trendy, outlaw Yeah, types, she, you yeah. Know, she, she was <laughs> smitten with one of them in particular. But anyway, so she sort of palled up with them. Anyway, and so... That's and that story. Then, if, if you haven't seen the film Black Panther Woman, you should see it. It's really, really interesting. There's cool. this young Aboriginal girl in this world that's massive, you know, this yeah. New York and all this mayhem going on, and she was right in the center of it. Um, so she was out there as a special guest because the film was showing, right? So she was doing a couple of talks anyway. Just so happened one night, I was in the in the um, uh, down the foyer trying to get internet because you know it's very patchy up there, but yeah. trying to get internet. <laughs> And she's come home late because uh, she'd been at dinner with friends and they dropped her off. And she, she was of an age by this stage of the game. Mm-hmm. And she went to walk up the stairs and just, look, no, nah, legs can't handle the stairs. <laughs> I need to have a rest first. So she's come over and sat down next yeah. to me and said, do you mind if I just sit here and chill for a bit? And I said, yeah, God, no worries at all. And we ended up talking for hours and hours yeah. and hours. And we just had a great old time. Anyway, day or two later, every time we saw each other, we'd stop and have a chat again, have a coffee and all sort of stuff. Anyway, we're sitting down in the, in the foyer this particular morning and we're having this very deep conversation about, <laughs> about you know, life, the universe and everything. And Connor's come running in with the camera and goes, hey, Dad, is this my new mum? Is this my new mum? And I'm like, oh, will you fuck off? Like, and I'm seriously telling him. <laughs> they are actually And she's like, what the hell is this dick? Like, oh, dick get out of here, get out <laughs> so, so, anyway. Bloody kids. Bloody <laughs> kids. So we get back to Brisbane and we sort of said, oh, look, yeah, let's pal up for a cup of coffee or something. Anyway, we went over to Brisbane and about a week or two later, he called me up and said, hey, look, that couple of those videos are popping off on Instagram. He said, I think there's probably a bit of, um, we can probably stretch this out of it and do a couple of skits. Do you want to come and give us, a, give us a hand? I went, yeah, sure. And that's when we did the belt. The yeah, 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 yeah. Pulling off the belt and whipping it, right? Yeah. And so that then became the gag. And so we did a couple of ones. But um, again, Connor's very, very savvy with this stuff. He knows not to like we haven't done a belt video for a long time yeah you don't burn it don't want to burn keep it keep it that's right. yeah. evil what's he yeah. up to next yeah so the belt yeah. the belt comes back every now and then but you still get it I still see videos that we do where I where I if I'm playing a, a, a hardcore character or something 
mm. you know, the, the comments will come in and say, hey, you should have pulled the belt, you know, where's the belt, do the belt. Yeah, well, yeah. Probably with the belt. The, you know, the niche following of the, the, niche following uh, the belt. Child abuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's funny. I actually got that belt out in Winton, actually. Um, <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a, a, like a leather plaited sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And it's quite a nice belt. And then we lost it. Yeah. And so I didn't have the belt. <laughs> so I was, and so the knee belt. Some the fan probably has it. Winton. That's no right. Yeah. So <laughs> the next time I went out to Winton again, I went to the same place because it, it was at a craft shop that sort of is up. I went in there and said, please tell me you got maybe no, they did. So it must be a mobile that makes it. Oh, so you got a re- Got a rough. Right. Second one. belt. Same belt. Yeah. Uh, that happened to me on uh, my wedding night, playing in the pool in the villa because we got married in Tuscany, for anyone who doesn't know. And it was the best, beautiful mansion thing. And um, we're playing volleyball, and then like my <laughs> ring just exploded off my hand some at some point in that game. So then we're like looking for it secretly. All the boys, without telling Shah, my wife, just newly wife, six hours in, maybe five hours in, oh that I lost my ring already. Oh my <laughs> so God. we're all like walking around the pool, trying to like put your feet on every area, you know, the night in the pool, and we're searching and searching. And then my friend Stacy, is she's like searching like the seats and stuff in case it flew past over, over the pool anyway so like after like 10 minutes Sean's like what are you doing and like realises so we have to tell her that we've like can't find it and we'll I'm like well, it'll be in the morning it'll be like sunny it'll be bright we'll just go bang and, you know we just can't find it now yeah. so she, and it's just like oh yeah okay fair enough it's only a thing anyway so we wake up everyone's hung over of course big fun wedding night party because everyone's staying at the one place for the wedding and party and then um, Chance Grandma had already found it in the morning with a, you know, oh, proper, proper woman search, yeah. as she called it. Ah. She's <laughs> gone down there and <laughs> down the 50 stairs, down to the pool that she didn't like to go up and down oh much, and just searched the, and it was like, it wasn't ever in the water, it was like out in the thing with the seats and stuff. But, uh, oh my God. yeah, lucky we actually, uh, we found yeah, it. my um, good friend of mine, George Zantis, um, well in his 70s now, and he grew up in a little island called Kithara um, in the Greek islands, right? Beautiful. And, yeah, beautiful. These, they, they, it's a lot of, lot of Australian Greeks come from Kithara. So mm-hmm. I guess there's more people from Kithara here than are in Kithara. But anyway, <laughs> um, but when he was, when he met his wife, or they were courting, you know, as they do, um, they were in Kithara and, and he took her out to go swimming in this boat. And he's on this little, little rowboat that mm-hmm. gone out. And of course, the water, he said, was about probably 15 foot deep. But clear as a bell, right? yeah, you could just beautiful. absolutely crystal clear. So anyway, they've gone swimming and had a bit of a, you know swim, and you know, they go back in the boat, and he says, "All right, we'll better get back in now." She goes, "Oh my god!" And her charm bracelet mm-hmm. had, was missing, and he said, "Oh shit!" And she goes, "Well, it's look, it's it's like it'd been handed down from generations." Oh, no, the it was like a thing. And she said, "We, I just cannot go home without. We've yeah. got to find it, right?" So he starts duck diving, duck diving, duck diving, trying to find this mm-hmm. thing for hours Jesus. and hours and can't find it right it's not anywhere to be seen nowhere came back and eventually says it's getting dark so it's getting to the point where it's dangerous now we've got to go in because right? otherwise you know tired all sort of stuff we're going to be in trouble and she's crying her eyes out and he's thinking oh no this you know, it's nice the, the whole about, wedding's yeah. gone right there's no there's, yeah. this girl's not going to go on a second date with me again this is all over at Rover <coughs> and he's had to just put me the hard ass and say no we're going, go going in safety, it's yeah. done we're going right Pulls the anchor up, hanging off the anchor. <laughs> Kids in that charm bracelet hanging off the anchor. What the? So it just floated exactly there, like when she looked. How'd she get fling it off? That's interesting. Yeah, oh, you always wear it every there. day, and then suddenly it's a, yeah. just like the, the ocean, like the yeah. slipperiness of it. My, my sister in law lost her mother. So um, this is my, my wife's sister. Mm-hmm. So their mother passed away years ago, old aunt. And Kathy had been given a ring. Like, you know, the jewellery gets shit out. And she had a mother's ring. And she was living in the UK and then came to move back and was packing everything and could not find this ring. Like, it was, you know, devastating. It was like her prized possession. Mm. Could not find her mother's ring. And um, and so she and like she was just distraught beyond belief for, for months afterwards. She's had, because she's you know, had to come back. So she's come back to Australia. Anyway, years later, she's going on a holiday to Tasmania. So she goes and gets all the winter woolies out and she gets her glove out and goes to put a glove on and goes, what the hell is that? <laughs> and because the ring had come Isn't off. Because you don't wear gloves in Australia. So she wore yeah, gloves so in England. Yeah, they haven't worn it for so long. So she's yeah. taken the glove off in England. The ring's come off inside the glove. 
It's actually crazy that you can, like how you can't find the thing. That there was some, there's some fable about when you stop looking, you truly find. Yeah, there is you know, some, like something about that. Some, yeah, it's always in yes. like written writing. It's like a kind of a cliche thing to say about you know lost. That is true though, lost items. But it kind of like works, right? You yeah, like, totally. Like don't look, and then you just. Like, well, I know. Do you get it from a writing perspective? I get it from a writing perspective. I'll be sitting there, and I'm and I'll be absolutely stuck with thinking. I will rack my brain. I'll mm-hmm. go two or three nights sleeping. Well, not sleeping, thinking, oh, what happened to this? Da, da, da. Yeah. And then I say, you know what? Forget it. And I'll go and start doing something else completely, writing a different thing or whatever. And then bang, it'll just go. And you're not thinking about it. You go, oh, I'll just do that. Yeah. And the story. Yeah. So, so what's that? Um, the War of Art, is it? The book about the muse? Oh, the, the guy Art of about War. The mu- Art of War, is that what yes. it is? Yeah, he talks about the muse yeah. and how it can't, will either come to you or not. And you oh, have to sit down and oh, try and sense. write. And sometimes it won't. It's like it's a force, like it's not like okay. within you. It's actually you're like the conduit of the oh, really? creation. Did you yeah, read that yeah. from a sporting point of view, though? Like from a basketball? Yeah, well, like literally, <laughs> uh, it doesn't make sense if you're if you think about it in like a pragmatic, like yeah, like yeah. A, yeah, as an athlete, right? So I literally, I'm obviously old now. I played a game of basketball last night. If you, oh, do, if you wait for, you know, the ball to go on the hoop, no, you've got to go put it in. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually sense, as I simple guess, as yeah. it is, yeah. Well, I know Wayne Bennett, the Brisbane Broncos, or the, the, now the Brisbane Dolphins yeah. coach, football coach, he, years ago, was, was rattling on about that book, with the, the Art of War, and was telling all his mm. players to read it and all that sort of stuff, so it must be something that... Yeah, I think it would be... Uh, it's something we could wreck. I haven't read it, so I've just heard it recommended. Really really <laughs> yeah, right, no. So I'm like, I should read it. But like, I've heard everyone reference that yeah. when it comes to those things of like writer's block, right? Of like, okay. okay, I'm a writer. So what we're trying to do on this new podcast is give tips. Mm-hmm. So your tip here is to walk away and like, yeah, walk away. Actually, have a break and not yeah. sit there and kill yourself on the yeah. writer's room. Yeah, let yeah. the idea breathe rather than try and force it. Let it just come. Yeah. Yeah, I'll often find one of the things I do with creation, like forming the, the, the concept before it's mm-hmm. a script, before it's, I'm actually doing it, yeah. is I actually uh, battle, I fight against the idea. Yeah, which that means makes sense. I'm telling, I'm kind of rejecting it and, and making it come back, if that makes sense. That makes like perfect making sense it me, yeah. important. Does that make sense? I don't yeah. know how to explain it. So I have the idea, I go, oh yeah, that could be a cool film or whatever. And then I try and forget about it just to see if it comes back. Mm-hmm. Cause then to me, it tells me it is important and it is a good concept and it's yeah. worth telling. Absolutely. Those, those seeds that get stuck in your head sometimes, they just don't go. And mm-hmm. I think, and they won't go until you get them out by writing it. That's the yeah. only way to get it out of your head. Um, yeah. It's funny you should say, when you say about, about letting the idea formulate most of it, because there's that school of thought about writing as a stream of consciousness, which Hugh used to go, one of our lecturers at uni, Hugh, was always about stream of consciousness and just let it fly, let it fly, let it fly. Mm-hmm. But I think if I have like a, like a peanut of an idea and I try and do that, it's shit. I'll write absolute shit. But if I do what you do, and exactly what you say, if I, if I allow that to permeate in my head for a couple of months, mm-hmm. by the time I get down to actually write, the story's pretty much already written in my head. It's kind of it's kind of already gone through. I've had the story. I've got I've got where I'm yeah. going, without even really thinking too hard about it. It's kind of there. So when I do sit down and write it, then it just becomes this. And it's not stream of consciousness because I'm making it up on the spot. But it's it's just sort of okay. Oh, that's right. That worked. That one. And it just it just formulates itself. It writes itself in that case. And you get like I try and tell people, like you know, people don't think we have real jobs. <laughs> and I say, look, I sometimes sit and I look, I've got a whiteboard here of a feature of a film I'm writing oh, off camera. Oh, I sometimes sit and just look at it and play the scenes out in my head and yeah. what the, what's the key dialogue, where's the scene funneled down to, yeah. and like run it and run it and run it for an hour and then I go, don't write. Yeah. I go, clean the house, you know? Yeah. It is, it's still work. There's a story about Michelangelo going to look at the block that he's mm-hmm. going to sculpt, you know, yeah. of the, what is it, marble? So yeah, marble, the, the, marble, the, yeah. the phone booth shaped marble that's going to become some beautiful sculpture of a woman or whatever. And he he goes like at nine to five every day for yeah. months. And the guy's like, when's he going to start? He's not nothing. Mm. And then eventually the, the guy who's 
paying for it goes, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm working. And this goes back to looking at the marble. Yeah. So it's like in his head, he's pre visiting it basically, right? He's yeah. like taking this care and time to craft this thing mentally before he puts the pen to paper, before he puts the chisel in. Yeah. It's like an interesting... That is interesting, yeah. Like, uh, like difference between, you know, like something like this, like art compared to shooting the basketball. You shoot the basketball, you're going to get the basketball to go in the hole more. You're working, you're yeah. digging a ditch, you've got to put the shovel on the ground. But there's something to art where you can do a lot mentally. You can, like, mm. walk through it. You can pre-visit, visit, like, you can talk yeah, and talk it's, about it's it and fun. it can be beneficial yeah. or it could be a waste of time and it depends on your process yeah that visualization stuff i mean it's it's all very airy fairy bit but you know people i know that are, that use it swear by it so mm. i mean particularly from a sporting perspective yeah because they have sports psychologists that talk about yeah. visualizing your shot going in or whatever it is yeah well it was matt hayden the, the cricketer mm. that's what he used to do day before the test would start he'd go out and sit on the pitch with his bat and just sit there and previs his entire innings, visualize playing every shot. Oh, like in depth. In depth, yeah. Then go so he'd sit up there, so he's in the environment, yeah. but he's not physically playing the shots or anything. He's just. Do you know the writer Scott Adams, or cartoonist really, Scott Adams, who did Dilbert? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. So yeah. the Dilbert books, they're very good, and, and Scott Adams clearly knows that corporate world and sort of stuff. Mm. Um, so he started writing. Um, Dilbert books, but then adding, you know, not just the comic, he would write, you know, um, quite a bit in there about, you know, life, working, you know, new millennial sort of stuff. Very, very interesting stuff, very good. But about his third or fourth book, he then started writing about visualisation, how he uses it and how, you know, these, these things that had occurred in his life when he, he'd visualised himself getting a particular mark in an exam and then it would have come like that to him. And it was a very interesting read. Anyway, then he didn't write anything for about two or three years. And then another book came out and, and the preface of this book was, I wasn't going to do this again because I copped so much shit <laughs> over this pre, like talking about this Viz stuff. Everyone, he got, apparently he got emailed, he got letters from people saying, you're a whack job, you're a of <laughs> so shit. They always say like, when you're actually, you know, super famous, like these comedians and stuff, I listen to their podcast or whatever, they'll be like, don't read the comments, it's so, they're gonna, you're only going to focus on the one guy oh, who's that's like, right. that is he true. sucks or whatever. That is <laughs> true, know? yeah. That is true, actually. Because it's, it's right. sad you have negativity bias as a person. It's like, you know, innate, like, yeah. survival instinct. So you look look at 10 positive things and you find the one negative. Yeah. And you focus on it because it's like a problem or threat in your, like, primal brain. So yeah. you actually have the bias to, like, think about that is true. the negative ones. That is true. It's the negative ones that will take up the space in your Yeah, head, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, how do you stop that? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, there's like, <laughs> obviously you can work on, like, the acceptance of yeah. that, like... I, don't know. I always think of the Kanye watch. West quote for he was super cancelled of my haters make me famous so that's the kind of attitude oh, wow. you need to have when people hate on you okay. yeah. you know what I mean like if you're there if they care enough to not like you yeah. you must be doing something yeah. that's basically the idea mm-hmm. but um yeah so let's talk about serious acting so you get you go in uni and you're having fun and you're doing voiceovers and newsreaders and yeah. all sorts. Look, it's and then how do you get to like... It's a serious... People idea. giving you these serious roles, drama, plays, all yeah. this stuff. Yeah, look, it's funny. I've, I've, I don't know if I've told you this story, but um, Candace, Candace Hill, Candy. Mm-hmm. So we were on a film together and um, it was um, a very... Specific, she was the star. She was being, I, was just, I was just a little small role. Um, but her her character has come to visit my wife and she's left her child in the car, night time, she's just ducked up to say good day. She comes back down to the car and the kid's gone, right? So her child's gone. So she's freaking out. Jeez. I come downstairs, what's going on, what's going on? Um, oh, the kid's gone. And I say, look, okay, hang on, let's look at the car. Did you leave it unlocked? No, so obviously he's letting him out. No one's come and take him. He's, he's wandered off by himself. And I'm trying to make you know, calm the situation, yeah. right? And it's like a very quick shot, da da da, very quick scene. But when I've rocked up for this, so the guys, so Jake Doak is shooting, right? So, and you know, a couple of the guys from uni are, are on the crew. So in between each take, I'm playing Freddie Fuckabouts and just <laughs> not joking. I think, you know, Jake, showing off. Jake's farting <laughs> and we're just having fun. And then 
Yeah, it's like, okay, and ready for the next thing? Yep, yeah. action, and I'll pull it straight back in again. Yeah. Anyway, and Candace has gone off around the corner in between each take after mm-hmm. a while. Anyway, and clearly her character is in a far more emotional state than, than my character. Yeah. But anyway, after the thing, we were, walking, we were walking back to the cars after the end of the shoot that day, and Candace says to me, I don't know how the fuck you do that. I said, well, she goes, look, I like a loose set. And you know, Candace, she does. She's, mm. she's, she's, she's really you know, heaps of fun. And she said, I like a loose set better than anyone, but we're doing this heavy scene and you guys are fucking around. <laughs> so I had to walk around the corner just to get my hands. I said, oh, yeah. yeah. I said, look, with all due respect, though, Candace, the reason that, that you were and I was doing this is because you're a trained actress. You've actually <laughs> got training, right? I've just fucking learned on the set of Cracker Milk, all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and then, but then we, and she saw we had a laugh about that, but she did say something. She said, yeah, but, but that's comedy. And I said, yeah, but not always, right? It might be for comic effect. Mm, you don't but play it. Quite yeah. often I'm playing like a serious, yeah. and that's where the comedy is, but I've got to play it in a serious way. So, mm. so I think that's kind of where it comes from. That's actually just a little sneaky tip in there because we do a lot of comedies. I always tell actors who aren't comedy actors so they know to not come in and try and be funny. Because they Absolutely. Think, oh, oh, it's a comedy and they're like, overly playing everything no, and I'm like no no what mind. makes it funny is that you're so frustrated about the situation yeah. and we get to laugh at you you can't be funny you're not yeah. having fun in the scene or whatever you know whatever the scene is yeah. but it's really important to play it straight as a, a drama actor coming in comedy correct there's such there's such a way to play comedy and which is why I say John Goodman's the greatest actor I've ever seen in your life John Goodman he's very funny he's yeah. perfect that's right but he's I mean the guy can play dramatic in mm. the flash and that's the reason if you look at that there's not a great deal of difference between his drama and his comedy he's, he's mm. he, he, he walks that line better than anyone Stephen Root's another one uh, love Stephen Root yeah, so yeah. You know, most underrated actor on the planet yeah there's heaps of those uh, those character actors yeah who just should be so much more yeah you know, like. should be yeah so um, that's kind of where I came from um, I think the I, I did a play yeah. Where I played a, a hard ass. You kind of saw it. Actually. The Western, the Western one? one, yeah. And I think that was where Richard saw Richard and Natalie, um, who did Santa Hunters. So this is a guy at the uni with and his partner, Natalie. They they saw me in that, and Richard said it was after that that he thought of me for Santa Hunters. They can do because it's like like dramatic. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny, but he's he's actually he and Natalie have both said to me when they wrote that character. It was a. It was probably more. It was probably more comedic mm. than I've ended up playing it mm. in the film. It's always so interesting to see what actors do with the yeah. character and how they interpret it. Well, they, they've said it works because because it's, it's three different stories in that film, mm-hmm. and I think um, Janelle Bailey, her character story is very dramatic, very you know, um, you know, life's work. And, crime and all that sort of stuff. It's very dramatic. And Janelle's a brilliant actress, so Janelle Bailey. And then the other character, Andrew, has got a very... Um, his story's hard, but he plays the comedy side of it so brilliantly that it's that's where the humour, I think, is in the thing. And mine is kind of a mix between the two. And I think my character has ended up kind of being the heart of the story, okay. everything else. And so I've played him very sympathetically. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't go in there thinking this guy's a buffoon. Yeah. He's a guy that believes in Santa Claus, right? So I mean, it's very easy to play that guy as an idiot. Santa's not real. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was very easy. It would have been very easy to play him as a fool, as an idiot. Mm. But but you know, when you do your your, your character, you do your backstory and sort of stuff, and then talking. You have to character. like relate to that. That's that's a great 100%. tip as well as an actor, right? Like so. You're playing a guy who believes in Bigfoot or whatever. Well, you genuinely have to believe in it. You have to but find think, what it is that makes them believe in that. You do that as a writer, though, don't you? Yeah, of course. Of course. When you're doing a character, voice. you've got to find the truth in that character, yeah. right? And that's yeah, that, that's as simple as that. Otherwise, it's you, you just make it's it so shit. important with, <laughs> with villains is to like justify their actions, think in their space Man. and in their head, and why am I, you know, literally the 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 executioner, yeah. you know, go to the extreme. Like, what is what is their like belief of their role in so life and their purpose? You reminded me of when I did um, in in our final year. Um, Joel went and made a movie instead, 
and Brando and I decided to do um, script writing instead. <laughs> so you, you had a choice in our final year. Um, so um, so Brando and I decided, Brandon Witcher had decided, and I shouldn't say that, there were 10 Six other people in the class. Writing team. a feature film, right? Writing, did, we yeah. did feature film instead of doing a great film. Um, it was the first year they'd done that, actually. It was, that was the first time they'd done that. Anyway, but we had um, Priscilla Cameron, great screenwriter. She... Um, uh, butterfly was, Trees, are the right? Butterfly name? Tree, yeah. Yeah, okay. So Priscilla was, um, was the head, and Shane Armstrong was also part of the, the faculty of running that course. So when, because Priscilla was running around Toronto Film Festival and... Yeah, and like pushing the film. Touring then, yeah. Yeah. Tish, so she was a bit of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, amazing. Really, yeah. And like having access to Priscilla. So, but her big thing was, A, about doing the heavy lifting before you write a word, right? So you've got to do all this stuff. But, but she, and there were many different um, strategies and tricks and, and things that Priscilla had us do to get into the heads of our characters and get less. But one of the things she did was have us write a diary as our main characters. Now I had four main characters in mind and um, so I had to sort of work yeah, out the great tip, character diary. So how long did you do that for? Months. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So that's really intense. I wrote every day, I wrote a diary for months as each one of these. Did you do it in a line or did you space it? Because that's interesting because of the head space you're in. Like did you go, okay, I'm writing A and then I'm yeah. writing B straight away? Because no. I think that could mess you up. I had, to, I had to be a bit tricky because... What I, the story I was writing was a pretty heavy drama. Mm -hmm. um, so what I ended up doing is I ended up doing five characters, mainly because one of the characters I was writing was a, um, I always say hebophile, because that was the actual thing, but pedophile is probably more apt. But, but if you want to be specific, he was a hebophile and a bad person. He was my... The difference is what, they're slightly older kids? Yeah, slightly older. Okay. Hebophile, like, like, you know, to be too bloody hardcore into it but they were they like them to be just on that pubescent area mm. 10 to 12 type of thing yeah anyway um yeah and this is the feeling you've got right now yeah it is the feeling, feeling yeah, i get any time i think about, about this character but i had to write this character and embody this character so i had to write a bloody diary as this mm. character i could do it for probably 15 to 20 minutes before yeah. it just got to uh like ick. and i wasn't writing about you know, it was just general day to day stuff, right? Yeah, you but writing, it, but you don't go so. into actions and shit like mm. that. But just trying to get your head around, define this guy's voice, the way he thinks, how he would talk, what his mannerisms would be around his wife, because he's 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 acting, he's playing it. You know, he's he's he's, he's pretending to be someone he's not around his wife and, and mm. yeah, of course. Right? So having to find that. But what I would do then was one of my characters, one of my peripheral characters, was a really nice old guy who looked after the, the protagonist in my story and was just this really generally lovely bloke that everyone loved. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go and do him for 10 minutes. Just to cheese just to, it's like to, to, <laughs> to cleanse my mind right, to get out of that <laughs> shit, right? Um, oh but God. when I did... So the um, Mark Travis, who... who you would have worked more. The with Travis technique. The Travis technique. So, Basically interrogates you. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. So he's a director and, and a writer um, who, he's a bit of a Hollywood script doctor. I think they bring him in to fix scripts or films that are going off the rails. They need to pull him in lately then. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So Griffith would bring him out every year to, um, to sit down and, and, and spend, spend a week with the directors who are doing their grad film. And... Um, and basically show them his technique on how to direct actors. And it's this, it's, he calls it the Travis technique, as you said, and it's about interrogation. You question, 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 question. The actor in character. So he came out to do it with, with you guys that year, but for that, for that year, he set aside a, a day or two to, to spend with us writers and sit down with his, with his wife, the two of them. Mm -hmm read our scripts and then sat down and, and spent a couple of hours with each of us one-on-one -on -one and went through the problems we have, were having with it and story and what right. we thought we should do. It was, it was excellent. And he let me tape it, let me record the whole thing, so I've got it all there. But one of the things he did was, okay, let's look at your two main characters, your protagonist, your protagonist. And he said, let's investigate these guys, but using the Travis technique. So he made me sit there. So then you're room. playing them, basically? play the character. I had to play both characters. Oh, and I had to play the bad guy, yeah. I had to play the hero file. 
And for 20 minutes, he sat there and interrogated me as that character. Mm. And from my like, call, oh, it was still, I still get the ickies when I think Just about that me, whole man. thing, man. It was horrible. It was horrible, but incredibly helpful. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about, you know, writing tips and things like that, that's, that's full on. Um, if you're going to, rather than doing that, I would suggest from a writer's perspective, easy to do it. One of the other things that, that I, and I've got a list of it at home that I do, and I find this incredible, it's, it's very simple, it's very easy, and it's, and it's so helpful. Um, I write down um, things like my, uh, embody the character, pretend I'm being the character, and then I work on what their favourite things are. Um, you know, Priscilla had a list of do they wear boxes or briefs, do they, you know, and all these stuff that works for her. Mm-hmm. Um, I find working out what music they like, what kind of art they mm-hmm. like, and why. So you don't just say, oh, they like rock music, or they like, you know, why? Work out why they like that particular thing, and it gets you an insight into their psyche. You know, you can, yeah. you can, and particularly from a backstory point of view, you can work out why they, why would they like that particular art? You know, as them that they like that sort of style of music or that song. Yeah. Why that song? I also love to make. Um, it's another thing for the overall feel of the film, like you're making the soundtrack. Like I'll go on Spotify. Yeah. And I'll make a music list for the project. Yeah. And then if it's, say, it's a short film you're making, I'll actually play it on set yeah. when we're, like, setting up or whatever. Sam, Mendes. The Sam Mendes does that. Yeah. Okay. Um, he did it for... Uh, I remember listening or watching a, a, the making of American Beauty. Mm-hmm. And Annette Benning said that um, he gave all of them a mixtape of the sort of music that he thought that that... The character, oh, her character. Yeah, her I've character. done that before as well. Yeah, yeah. so you give them, so, like, homework for the actors. Yeah. So, and funny enough, it actually worked in in in, um, in American Beauty. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where she's and Benny's character is getting a house ready for a show because she's a real estate agent, mm-hmm. and she's getting the house ready for a showing, and she's repeating to herself, you know, I will trying. sell this house. Yeah, I will sell this house. <laughs> but then there's a, a scene that's related to that where she's she's singing in the car. I think I'm still here, and she's like this funny, and that was one of the songs that he'd given her. And so she brought that into the scene and was like, oh, yeah, she loved that. Though. Yeah. It just sort of fit with the character. Oh, and she just started singing it. Like she just started singing it. Then he's like, now we've got to pay for that song, right? That's true too. <laughs> yeah, I think they can afford it. That was a show tune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the kind of things we can't do. You go, that's oh, exactly that song right. would be perfect. Oh, we can't, we can't get the rights of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think music, it's so powerful. It's actually annoying as a, someone who isn't musically talented at all because she... Music can make people cry like that. Like it's so emotive. Oh, God. It cuts straight to your like core, like your heart or wherever you believe that those feelings come from. Yeah. Easier than a film, and that's why music in film is so palatable and like. Yeah, funny enough, I was. Hate. Funny you should say. I was only just listening to a podcast the other week with um, John Williams, mm-hmm. um, the the you know, the maestro. One more Academy was uh, Jurassic Park, Jaws, all of Spielberg. Spielberg, anything Spielberg, but um, yes, I was, was the other ones. You know, all of them. Um, I think he's won more Academy Awards than anyone in history, hasn't he? Surely he's got like probably yeah for like the composition. Yeah. 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 Anyway, he was he was talking about because then the question was asked: Do you see the film or see the see the thing and then sit there and write the music to it, mm-hmm. or is it any other thing? And he said normally that is the way. He said, but it, the one of the guys, one of the interviewers in the thing brought up that their favourite bit of music that he'd ever written was the the big final scene of um, of E. T. When ET gets up and flies mm, off, flies the thing, right? the bike, ET, yeah. ET goes home, right? Yeah. And the music that fits to that, right? He said it's it's astonishing. And this guy was saying, I've remembered it. And this guy who was doing the interview was a was a classically trained pianist. He said, I'm mm. trying to find the music for it. It just doesn't exist. I can't get out there. Anyway, Williamson starts talking about that, and he says that actually, in that particular moment, he didn't know how to do it, so he wasn't quite sure how to fit it. And so Spielberg said to him. You write the music first, and then I will. Because he had the footage already, he said I'll cut it to the music. So he actually did that whole final scene. Everything else has always been he will he will. Wow, the that's thing. interesting. But Spielberg actually cut the cut the ending to fit the score. So he had like a lot of coverage, I'm saying. Yeah. Edited the scene. To the, yeah. Wow, that is really mm. that, that's a empowered composer. Very much. Composer. Yeah, very <laughs> much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's stage of the game, though, they'd work together. You know. Yeah, yeah, He yeah, gave him jaws for Christ's sake. Gave him that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nothing better. 
And then yeah. I always think of Jurassic Park. I think beautiful thing. It is Jurassic Park. Because that's like my childhood movie. Well, I watch it later. You know, the Star Wars. Yeah, did he go to Star Wars too? He did Star Wars. Oh, yeah, because Luke Spielberg, they all connected, eh? Yeah. Oh, wow. So he's just done all the... Yeah, the they're all iconic. Just, they're massive. And now Hans Zimmer is the new one Zimmer. that does like the Nolans yeah. and the big moves. Yeah. Yeah. I am desperate to watch Paddington 2, but only because... Is it because of the Nicolas Cage? Because of the... Say it's that's it's exactly right. It's the, only, <laughs> it's the only reason I want to watch it because I saw that film and they're all... Right What's your opinion Paddington on Cage? 2? Because he's very divisive. I think he's brilliant. If you don't think Nicolas Cage is one of the greatest actors of our generation, watch Pig. Pig's That'll, great. Fucking Pig is is great, great film. One of my favorite films of all time. But also, I love him in the crazy roles. I love him oh, in a bad yeah. movie. I love yeah. him in a good Look, movie. Leaving Las Vegas was like mind blowing. I loved him just going mental in that one yeah. scene in any movie. Like it's, it's just fun. Have you seen uh, Dream Scenario? Yeah, love it. Loved so it. good. So clever. So good. Dream Such Scenario. Such a European filmmaker's film. Yeah, this is yeah. it. It's yeah, great idea. If you haven't seen that, that's on Netflix or Stan or something yeah, like that. One of, them, one of them. Yeah, it's it's newish. I saw it in the film. I saw it in the cinema. Oh, it's really good. And um, and it wasn't. It was. It starts what you're expecting, mm. but it doesn't go where you're expecting. Yeah, it does it's, it's it's a great great mindfuck. Uh, I find that bit when the girl has the like sexual dream of him, and then she tries to create it. So funny how he just has no. That's so charisma, cringy. and he can't it's pull it off. So on. cringy. It's a really funny scene, though. Look, it's so brave of him to play. I mean, he just, he can do anything. He does, he'll just take on anything. Yeah. That's what I like about him. Yeah. He, um, like, he's not above a shit film, either. Oh, well, I think there's a thing of, like, that these actors, there's quotes of this probably, that there's people who have to work because it's good for their mental health, and he's one of those people. Mm. He's like, I'd rather be making a movie than at home, like, yeah, self-destructing, like, drinking or whatever, yeah. like, he does, you know. He's like, rather be just working, yeah. so... Yeah, obviously take some that are amazing, but I just find him interesting in everything I've ever watched. Yeah, like Mandy was really interesting a few years ago. Really? Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I will not watch Long Legs. Oh, is it? That's the new horror. Yeah, he's in that. Why? Well, you scared of it? I just don't watch horror movies. Don't watch horror don't. movies. Can't happen. He's scared of horror. Can't happen. Really? Yeah. Any? What's your like? Have you seen The Shining? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I love The Shining. That's that's um, uh, like. But why yeah. is that not scary? That's a freaky movie. It is free. There's a difference between freaky and scary, though. See, I find the more horror horror genre horror more boring and like formulaic. Yeah, and like, yeah, the formulaic stuff. People who love out. those films, you can they're just repeating, you know, because the, the, the this thing again. about they have to have the tropes. Remember that if you're writing horror, you've got to have the yep. tropes, apparently. Yeah, you've got and, to have the tropes. And they, or and they won't forgive you if you know don't. what they are and subvert them, like intentionally flip yeah. them, and then you'll still be yeah. acknowledging them. We've got a friend, Duncan Peak, who is a very good horror writer, and and he because he knows the tropes, he knows how to. All horror you know, writers are like, horror nerds who've seen every yeah. horror movie too. So like, it's gonna they're yeah. gonna. Yeah. See, I don't like the tropes. tropes. I don't like. Yeah, I like to the try and avoid yeah. certain ones. So it's it's horror horror annoys me for that reason. But you see, The Shining, you know that wasn't. Mm. A, I always like movie. the ones that are more like thriller horror. Yeah, hundred kind of percent. Like yes, shining would be I, I can't stand right. gory horror. That's yeah. what throws me. And I don't like being manipulated. I, I mean, everyone, when you're a viewer, you're always getting manipulated, no matter what the genre. But I don't like knowing I'm being manipulated as <laughs> blatantly as you are in horror. Oh, I, the yeah. really funny thing to do is watch a horror movie you were scared of and you liked, uh, just mute it. Because it's everything's the sound design and music. Yes. And so you just, if you watch it and it's like, the big bad who's coming to yeah. get you with the weapon and he's stomping up the stairs and you just take the sound out. It's not scary. It's like funny. You're like, this looks stupid. I remember seeing a 70s movie called Bigfoot or Sasquatch it might have been called. And it's it's really bad. It's got David Carradine in it. Oh, <laughs> Keith Carradine's dad, the old... No, his dad. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, that's that's David Carradine, sorry. So Keith, Keith, Keith is Carradine's dad. the dad. Oh, yeah, I've never even heard of him. Um, He's, he's, you've seen him in a million old films yeah, where he's just an old guy <laughs> anyway he, he's in it yeah. but it's clearly like made for a couple of hundred bucks and it's a guy in a suit like right. very much and they do the but they do the POV thing from Sasquatch's eyes when he goes to attack yeah. and there's a group of bikers so that go, I think if you 
it's like it's it's shot on video too, so it's so bad, <laughs> so bad. Sounds but good because it's, it's so bad. If you got you know those those channels that have like you know the movies that no one else will show because they're so cheap, cheap, you'll find it on one of those. <laughs> so like <laughs> like on YouTube, it's like yeah, but it's it's so squash. But the whole point of that was every time the attack was about to happen, it had this screeching violin soundtrack, this <laughs> type of thing. Kind of like Psycho. Not quite, but in that sort of yeah. realm, right? So, but I just, it, it gave me, as a kid watching that film, it gave me nightmares. And it's the music that did it. All right, Chris, do you have anything to plug? To plug? No, we've got what we've got. I've got Santa Hunts coming out soon. Um, awesome. Hopefully that'll be seen by the end of the year. Is that going to be like online release? Uh, I believe they're, they're looking at doing a cinema release. Of some oh, cool. Of so if you're a local, yeah. come along, mm. uh, meet the cast and the director. Yeah, hopefully that'll happen. Um, and yeah, then Cracker Milk. Milk. Cracker Milk is romping along. We've just hit the hit the million mark. Wow. Um, now we're up to a million and 80,000. Okay, uh, calm down, mate. you got the million. Tell me that it's two. That's right. <laughs> um, yes, hopefully we'll block on to that now. Um, I think we're sitting at... Um, 630 million views now, so we've cracked wow. half a billion views. So check out Chris's hilarious dabbing on Cracker, cracker milk. milk. Yep, Cracker and Milk. And all sorts of weird ideas on there. Oh, look, it's my <laughs> favourite one. It's funny, a lot of my favourite Cracker Milk ones I'm not even in. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, if I, if I had a favourite one that I'm in, it's probably The Mime. Have I seen The them? Mimes is uh, Nick and Connor are Mimes and I'm a copper. I'm a policeman who comes and sees them. Oh, okay, I might have seen that. I've seen the one where they're, it's like who's on heroin and you're the cop. Oh, that's, that's, cop, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's what I've been on. Same guy, the cop character. Yeah, the, the mine one hit the zeitgeist. I think the reel of that went, has hit the 44 million or something. Jeez. Those so, yeah, yeah. like online reels where it just plays at you, they just... Reels are great because people yeah. watch it, but you don't make any money off reels because there's no ads. Yeah, yeah, so but it's good for like, yeah, I guess... Pulling driving traffic, you traffic want to drive across, traffic to, yeah. to your main. It's really yeah. hard to get people to subscribe off that because they just go to the next thing. That's the that's the exactly path. right. Exactly. Yeah, right. That. You're really helping suck get rich. You're that's really right. Yeah, yourself exactly. much. that's why YouTube well. is a bit better because you have that. That's right. Which is why you've been sending lately. Who's us? Jack Zuck. Jack Zuck. Yeah, he's hanging out with Joe Rogan, mate. He's no, no, I know, but he's like his hair looks normal now. He's he's looking. Yeah, he's like got it. the glow up of being a trillionaire. Yeah. <laughs> Once you guys hit the trillion subscribers, yeah, you're not going to be as hot as Zuck now. Oh my god. Oh yeah, no, steal no. your idea off two twins and a Brazilian kid. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and oh mate, um, what's his name? Um, I own Brando's film, um, which I'm not quite sure where that's set now, but I know Brando's cutting it. Um, Meet Daddy. That's yeah, that's like an art. That's too. kind of a horror film. You'd be too scared to watch it's, your own film. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's true. But it's again, it's creepy horror, and again, black and white. So mm. a lot of it works. In oh, black. it's black and white. That's cool. Black and white. Oh, mate, I love black and white. Guy Guy Croft has crafted this film. Like it's it's, DAP, it's by the way. a beautiful guy. Yeah, awesome. It looks amazing. So that'll probably be going like festival run. Just more of a festival film. Yeah, I think so. That's that's probably Same where its market's going to be. Yeah. It's, um, it's um, what is brand? It's it's Brando's. It's almost not. I wouldn't say it's an ode about that, but it's um, it's um, he's a huge fan of um, um, Lynch. Mm. Lynch. It's Lynchian. Very Lynchian. <laughs> that's the best way. To so if that's your vibe, you'll like it. Yeah, particularly if you like early Lynch, like the a razor more, head. The Lynch. more crazy. A razor <laughs> oh, head. Yeah, it's it's in that realm. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's awesome. Mm-hmm. So you've got a bunch of stuff coming out. We'll um, put all your uh, socials and everything here and mm-hmm. Cracker Milk and all that. But yeah, thanks for your time, Christopher. Absolute pleasure, man. Always good to talk to you. Should we go to the pub or what do you reckon? Let's go to the pub. We'll go to the pub. Penny, Absolutely. good work. <laughs> 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 On your Penny.